So IFRS 15 revenue. Every company exists because they want to make profit. Okay, like profit making organizations exist to maximize the wealth of the shareholders. But in order to maximize the wealth of the shareholders, they must be able to generate revenue so that the revenue must be able to uh, then exceed the expenses, then they can make profit. But when revenue is being generated, it is very important we identify when the revenue can be recognized in the books of the entity. Because if we don't have rules on when revenue can be recognized, then an entity will just uh, say that, okay, we expect to receive uh, whatever, something, $100 million. Be because of that, we will include it in the current year revenue. What is going to be happening is that they are likely to then overstate revenue in one accounting year and understate revenue in the subsequent accounting years. So what then that means is that if there is no rule on how revenue is supposed to be recognized, then it will go against the qualitative characteristics of financial statements, which is faithful representation and relevance at the end of the day. It is for this reason why the standard IFRS 15 is very important to give, provide the guideline and the blueprint on how entities can recognize revenue generally. So we're going to be looking at this in two perspectives, like I mentioned, because one thing you must understand is that this standard IFRS 15 is actually replacing two previous accounting standards, the IAS 18 revenue, you know, and then IAS 11 construction contracts. So... It's actually going to be exp uh, it's actually replacing these two standards, and so the standard describe and explain the treatment in these two categories. Now, what does that mean then? It means that by default, what happened in IAS eighteen was that the entities recognize revenue immediately the transaction has taken place. What does that mean? It means that, for instance, an entity signs a contract. So let's say an entity signs a contract of a million dollars. And they signed a contract on 1st November, let's say 2021. And their year ended is um, 31st December 2021. That is their year ended, 31st December 2021. But then this contract that they have signed, they started work on the contract or they will start work on the contract somewhere on 2nd February 2022. Somewhere on 2nd February 2022. What does that mean? It means that as of the year ended 31st December 2021, no work had been done on this contract that was signed on 1st November 2021. And if no work has been done, then you cannot recognize any revenue in respect of the $1 million in the year ended 31st December 2021. But under AAS 18, because of the fact that, oh, transaction is recognized when a performance, when um, uh, the transaction takes place, the entity end up usually recognizing revenue including the 1 million in the 31st December 2021, justifying that, oh, we signed a contract before the year end. But they actually started, will start working in the subsequent year. When this happens, it means that the profit of 2021 has been overstated, while the profit of uh, 2022 will be understated due to the timing of the recognition of the contract and the time that work was actually undertaken. So to avoid this, that is where IFRS 15 comes to town. I hope you are getting the premise very well. To avoid this, that is what IFRS 15 comes to town. This is the key takeaway. If you're going to forget anything, don't forget this takeaway. So this is my key takeaway. Give me a moment. I think my pencil is uh, a little bit uh, messing me up. Let's see if I can get it to 
come up a little bit. Okay. So my key takeaway is this. This is the key takeaway. If you forget anything, don't forget this one. That under IFRS 15, that's the ultimate thing. Under IFRS 15, revenue is recognized when a performance obligation is satisfied, period. So that is the first takeaway I want you to have. Before we even dive into what the heck the standard is about, the breakdown of the standard, the first takeaway is that here, we only recognize revenue when a performance obligation is satisfied. What is a performance obligation? A performance obligation is simply the goods to be transferred or service to be rendered to the customer in exchange for the consideration received. That's it. Performance obligation refers to the goods to be transferred or the service to be rendered to the customer in exchange of the consideration received. What does that mean? So let's say that we are a company that's, you know, um, we, we let's say we provide education, so we teach, all right? So teaching services or tuition services, whatever the heck. It means that we will recognize revenue after we have provided the service. That's all. After we've provided serv the services. Okay, we sell goods. What, what can we sell? Okay, let's say we sell. What do we sell? Let's say we sell air conditioners. If we sell air conditioners as a company, when do we... Uh, recognize revenue we recognize revenue when the air conditions have been transferred to the customer or when we have agreed to the customer that we have transferred risks and rewards to the customer and i'm going to explain that also in a moment stay with me very carefully here so that is the key takeaway I want you to have. That under IFRS 15, revenue is recognized when a performance obligation is satisfied. It is when we have done the work, the risk and the rewards associated with the goods has been provided. Let's say we install air conditioners. Still in our illustration, we install air conditioners. Okay, so when do we recognize revenue as air condition installers? We will recognize revenue when we have finished installing and the customer says, I am satisfied, the air condition is working well, that was the place I wanted you to fix the air condition and everything is good. Then we can recognize revenue. So that is the primary thing. Okay. But you know, in some contracts, what's going to be happening is that the customer is likely to make some advance payments. So the question we then ask ourselves is, Supposed the customer makes an advance payment and we had not rendered any services, how do we recognize that? Because since we have not we're rendered any service, then we are supposed to, uh, we cannot recognize revenue. So how do we treat that advance payment? And that is takeaway number two, that any payment received in advance shall be recognized as deferred income. That's a liability. It's a liability. So any payments received in advance shall be recognized as deferred income. That's a liability. Because we now owe the customer. We owe the customer. So the customer has paid us in advance because probably the exchange rate and the Ghana City now are above $11 and all that. So the customer has made payment in advance. Okay, you receive the money, but 
you've not done anything. So that becomes a deferred income. And deferred income are liabilities. And so to be recognized on the face of the statement of financial position, it will be recognized on the face of the financial position. No PL. No PL situation. It's in the face of the statement of financial position. On the face of the statement of financial position. All right. So, principle number one under IFRS 15, revenue is recognized when performance obligation is satisfied. Principle number two, any payments received in advance shall be recognized as deferred income. Now, number three takeaway I want you to have, the third takeaway I want you to have is that sometimes the revenue is due but had not been received yet from the customer because of the nature of the contract. So if it is due, we have satisfied the performance obligation, but we have not received the money yet, then it will be recognized as contract receivable, and that is an asset on the face of the statement of financial position. So three, where? A performance obligation. Now, from now on, I'm going to take PO to be performance obligation. Okay, so when I write PO, I mean performance obligation. So where performance obligation is satisfied, but the amount is yet to be received, but the amount is yet to be received, the entity shall recognize revenue with a contract receivable. And this is an asset on the face of the statement of financial position. It depends on the contract. It could be recognized as a current asset or a current liability, depending on the uh, contracts we have available or the nature of the contract. It can be an asset or, uh, sorry, a, a long-term asset that is non-current asset or current asset. That is the idea about that. And like I said, all of these things, you're going to see them play out in a moment as we jump into our discussion, as we jump into our discussion. So, these are the key takeaways that I want you to have generally when it comes to IFRS 15. If you're going to forget anything, these three things should be with you. Okay? These three things should be with you. So, if you look at it in general, it means that IFRS 15 has two categories. The default issue I'm going to put my illustration a little bit down here. The default issue, which relates to uh, uh, the treatment of revenue. So default revenue recognition. And then revenue recognition where performance obligation goes beyond one account in a year. So these are the two things, beyond one accounting year. So there is the default normal one selling of goods. Then there is another one, which is where performance obligation goes beyond one accounting year. We are going to be focusing in the next few minutes on the default revenue recognition, normal one. Then God willing, tomorrow in the part two, we're going to be focusing on where performance obligation goes beyond one accounting year. All right, so stay with me carefully. So, if these are the various issues that we need to understand, the question is, how then do we recognize revenue? Now, remember, I've already stated that revenue is recognized when a performance obligation is satisfied. But that is the bare minimum. That is the final thing. The reason is that IFRS 15 describes a five-step framework for revenue recognition. So the five-step framework, and this can be asked by the examiner for theory purposes, the five-step framework. Of revenue recognition.
five step. So this is a theory part that examiner could throw at you in the exam hall for maybe three marks, you know, three marks. And I always say, if you have seen 47 before, you know, you appreciate three. So there are five steps that we go through or five stages we go through when we talk about revenue recognition as per IFRS 15. So I'm going to be going into my slide here in that particular case and then share thoughts with you. I'm coming in from our book on financial reporting uh, or corporate reporting. So those of you with the book, you can go with me to page 22255 because I'm going to explain the five-step framework generally there in that case. Five step. Step number one, identify the contract with the customer. That is the first step. That is the first step. Before we can talk about revenue recognition generally, before we can talk about revenue recognition generally, the first thing we have to ask ourselves is, is there a contract with the customer? Now, to be able to answer the question of whether there is a, con a, 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 a contract with a customer, there are certain conditions that must be met. Number one is that the contract has been approved by both parties. So in other words, both parties have signed the contract and say, okay, uh, so let's give an example. So we can give an example that let's say that uh, we have uh, whoever, let's say we have someone, Tracy, uh, contacts in Shira to provide tuition services. And so the first thing we need to ask ourselves is, is there a contract? Yep. So for instance, Tracy said, I want tuition for six months. And in Shira said, yes, I will provide tuition for six months. Is there a contract? Yep. And the six months Shira said, okay, I'm going to charge $10,000. And Tracy said, yes, I'm going to pay. I'm going to pay. So we have to first find out, have the two parties approved the contract? That's number one. Number two, each party's right in relation to goods and services to be transferred can be identified. So we know exactly what we are getting. Okay, so Tracy says tuition for six months. And Inshira is going to provide that tuition. So Inshira's work is the tuition here. And Tracy is going to be paying the money, generally. Tracy is going to be paying the money, generally. Then three, the payment terms for the goods and services can be identified. Okay, so how will this $10,000 be paid? It has been agreed on. Maybe you no, you pay all up front before the class starts or you pay 70%. Then two weeks after the class starts, you clear the rest. It has been stated out. The contract has a commercial substance. Definitely, there is money on the line, $10,000. You can see that. And then it is probable that the consideration will be received. That is very, very important. Because it is one thing to charge a client, it is another thing for the client to have the capacity to be able to pay for the goods. Okay, to be able to pay for the goods. So it is probable that after six months, we're going to be getting our $10,000. If all these things are present, then we can conclude and say that step number one, checked. There is a contract with the customer. That's the first thing. So in every question, the first thing we need to identify about revenue is to ask us to ourselves, is there a contract with a customer? Now, technically, you may not be able to identify all of them, but you can infer from the structure of the question whether there is a contract with a customer. But that is the first step. That's the first step. Then we come to the second step, identify the performance obligation. Remember in a, a few minutes ago, I, I explained what performance obligation is. In a simple language, performance obligation simply refers to the goods or services to be transferred to the customer in exchange of the consideration received or receivable. So if we go back to our illustration here for insurer and Tracy, insurer is going to be providing tuition services, number one. Let's say Insura is going to also give books as part of the deal. Number two, let's say that Insura is going to have 
organize an exams, a mock examination as part of the contract. That's the performance obligation. All right. So that is the idea. That is the idea. So tuition services, books, mock examination. That is the performance obligation. In every question, you have to identify what is the company doing? What, what's the role of the company here? You need to be able to identify that. That is the second thing. Step number three. We determine the transaction price. Very important. The transaction price. How much do we expect to receive in exchange of the goods that we are transferring or the services being rendered. That is the transaction price. So in the context of our illustration here, our transaction price will be equal to the $10,000, the amount we will receive when we satisfy the performance obligation. The amount we will receive or the amount receivable when we satisfy the performance obligation. But the fourth step is where the journey begins to get interesting. And I want you to stay with me very carefully here. Because the fourth step is to allocate the transaction price to the performance obligations in the contract. What does that mean? Because remember that it is likely we are going to be rendering more than one services for the amount of money being received, usually under the deal. So if you look at it here, the question we ask ourselves is, what are we doing? What is insurer doing under this deal? Insurer is providing tuition. Insurer is giving books. Insurer is organizing mock examination. All three for $10,000. The question we ask ourselves is, if insurer was providing tuition alone, how much will he charge? The books alone, how much will he charge? The mock examination alone, how much will he charge? That is what we refer to as the standalone prices. So we're going to be using the standalone price of each of the uh, performance obligations to allocate or share the transaction price. So let's go through this together so you understand what the heck we're talking about here. So if tuition services, insurer might have charged maybe $7,800. The books alone, insurer might have charged $1,200. Then the mock examination, insurer might have charged, let's say, $4,000. $4,000. So these are the standalone prices. Now, if you should put the three together as individually, let me punch that together, 7800 1200 Oh, I could do that. $13,000. So really, individually, insurer would have received $13,000, but insurer actually charged Tracy for $10,000. So the question we then ask ourselves in step four, which is where our focus is, is to allocate. How do we now share 10000 that we are receiving for each of the services that we are rendering? That is the fourth step, allocation. Allocation. So see how we're going to allocate this quickly. So tuition, books, and then mock, very simply. A very simple here. So tuition is gonna take what seven eight hundred over thirteen thousand over thirteen thousand multiplied by the transaction price, which is the ten thousand dollars here. So we punch it out. See the answer we get. Second scenario: one thousand two hundred dollars over thirteen thousand by ten thousand. We punch that out. Third scenario, that is $4,000 over 13,000 times $10,000. We punch that out. So let's punch these out respectively and see what we get. 7,800 by 13,000 times $10,000. That's going to be $6,000. Nice one. The next one, it's going to be 1200 And that's going to be an approximately maybe $923. Then the last one will be 
4,000. That's a little over 3,077. Something like that. So that is the allocation of the transaction price. Step four. Are we okay? If there are any questions, you put it in the chat for me. I see some of you guys joining. You are welcome. Uh, this is IFRS 15 that we are dealing with. Uh, very fundamental accounting standard uh, for financial reporting and corporate reporting. So if you join us, uh, give us a thumbs up on the video, guys. Uh, let's get some more engagement on the video. Share the video as well. Let's reach more people and more students. But most importantly, let me hear from you in the chat. Any questions you have for me, put it in the chat for me. If you're on YouTube, or put it in the comment section for me. If you're watching us on Facebook uh, as we continue with our discussion. So that is step four. Allocate the transaction price. Allocate the transaction price. So step one, identify the contract. Step two, what are we doing in the contract? Step three. How much are we charging for the contract? And then step four, we share or allocate the transaction price to the performance obligation. We allocate the transaction price to the performance obligation. Then the step five is what I told you in the beginning of our discussion, and that is recognize revenue when or as the entity satisfy performance obligation. That's what we're talking about here. That's what we're talking about here. So that is the five step. So if insurer enters the contract with Tracy, maybe at the date of entering into the contract, insurer may transfer books. So probably on the date that they entered into the contract, revenue will be recognized will be the book, which is 923. That will be the revenue we'll recognize. Why? Because that is the performance obligation that has been satisfied. That is the performance obligation that has been satisfied. That is the idea about the five-step framework. So like I mentioned, the examiner can ask you this for three to five marks in the exam hall. Uh, it's a theory written area that the examiner can throw at you. So it is very important you understand the treatment very very well. So these are the five steps that we go through for revenue recognition. So let's take a question quickly. Very simple illustration. Those of you with uh, my book on financial reporting or corporate reporting, this is in your book. If you happen to also enroll in our full courses online, this question is also in your question kit. Okay, so if you open your question kit, this is in your question kit as well on page 75 in the question kit. So if you enroll in our full FR or CR class, you will find this question in the in your question kit. Or if you have the book also, you can find it in the book. We want to use that as a guinea pig to illustrate what we are talking about here. If you don't have the book, then you just take a screenshot, okay? You just take a screenshot and you'll be good. So let's go and let's see what we can do in that regard. You ready? Let's go. How should Tele PLC recognize the revenue from this plan in line with IAS 18 and IFRS 15? Remember what I told you in my introduction. In IAS 18, we recognize revenue boom, when the contract is signed. But in IFRS 15, we recognize revenue when the performance obligation is satisfied. So let's see how Revenue is going to be recognized generally when we are dealing with the issue about IAS 18 and IFRS 15. Let's go. Aaron enters into a 12-month telecom plan with a local mobile operator, Tele PLC. The terms of the plan's plan are as follows. Aaron monthly fees fee is $100. Aaron receives a free handset at the inception of the plan. So stay with me carefully. We have to go through the process, the stages. You ready? Let's go through the stages together to identify what the heck is going on here. Uh, I think I got to open it here. Let's see. Identify the contract with the customer. 
So step number one, is there a contract with a customer? Yes. How? Because we are told Aaron entered into a 12-month telecom plan. And there are conditions that he will pay monthly fee and he will receive a free handset as well in that particular case. So, yes, there is a contract with customer, with a customer. Step number one, met. Step number two, performance obligation. What would Tele PLC do under this contract? What is Tele PLC going to do under this contract? Stay with me carefully. Aaron will receive a free handset. So Tele PLC number one will provide a free handset. But on top of that, it's a, it's a telecom company. So Aaron is make, p- making a monthly payment of $100. For that reason, Aaron must also receive internet services. So the second performance obligation here is the internet services. So there are two things that Tele PLC is doing here, giving a handset to Aaron. Then for every month, they must provide Aaron with internet services because it's a telecom company. Are you getting the step here? So that is step two, performance obligation. Step two, performance obligation. So step one, is there a contract with a customer? Hell yes, there is a contract with a customer. Step two, what is the performance obligation? What are we doing here? We are giving a handset and also internet services. Okay, let's let's go to step three. Step three says, determine the transaction price. How much is Tele PLC receiving under this contract? That is the transaction price. So if we look at the transaction price situation here, we are told that it's a 12-month telecom plan and Aaron is going to pay $100 per month. So it means that the transaction price is going to be $100 per month multiplied by 12 months, and that is going to be $1,200. Are you following the step? So is there a contract with a customer? Yes. What is the performance obligation? Free handset and internet. What is the transaction price under the contract? $100 every month for 12 months, and that is $1,200. Then let's see. What is the fourth step? Step number four is to allocate the transaction price to the performance obligations. So we've seen that they will, do, they will provide free handsets and then internet services. So the question we'll ask ourselves is, what is the standalone prices for these guys? If they, What is the cost of the handset alone and what is the cost of the internet alone? So let's see. Tele PLC sells the same handset for $300. Ooh. So the handset is $300. And the same monthly prepayment plans without the handset for $80 per month. Okay. So had it not been the handset, the internet service would have cost Aaron $80 times 12. And that is going to give us an amount of $960. So these are the standalone prices. So if we add the two app, that gives us $1,260. Are you getting the picture? That's the $1,260. So it is based on this that the examiner is asking you, how should the transaction be recognized in line with IAS 18? Pretty simple. Under IAS 18, what is going to happen is that the handset will be written off as marketing expenses. All right? Then the monthly uh, payment of $100 will be recognized as revenue. That's all. That's all. Under IAS 18, that's what we're going to do generally. That's what we're going to do. So look at my journal entry here. With IAS 18, the free handset will be treated as a marketing cost. As such, we only recognize revenue for each month as and when it's received. So once the month is due, we debit cash or receivable if 
Aaron has delayed the payments, and then we credit revenue. That is all. So under IAS 18, the handset will be treated as what? Marketing cost. Because that is what we are using to entice people to come and sign up with a plan and subscribe to the service or subscribe for the service. Does that make sense, please? That is IAS 18. That's what we do. So in IAS 18, we don't care about, oh, what is the performance obligation? What is the standalone price? What is the transaction price? What is the allocation? No, 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 we don't do all that. It is in IFRS 15 that we would have to go through the five-step framework. So under IAS 18, that will be what we do. The handset will be treated as marketing cost, meaning written off in the PL accounts. Then the annual or monthly uh, payments will be recognized as revenue in the books of the entity. But what if we are in IFRS 15? That is what we are excited about. If you are in IFRS 15, the handset is not free. The handset cannot be written off as an expenses, as a marketing cost. No, the handset is a service we are rendering. It's something we are doing under the contract. So then we need to allocate the transaction price to the performance obligation. So we go to allocation of transaction price. So stay with me very carefully here. There is a handset there. So with a handset, it's $300 over the total of 1260 multiplied by the transaction price of 1200 That will be the value for the handset. Then we bring in the internet services or, you know, whatever service that they will provide them. That's 960 over 1260 times 1200. So we punch that out. Let's see what we got. If there are any questions, put it in the chat for me or the comment session for me so I can take it. So I'm getting 286, then we're going to have 960, 1200, oh, sorry, 960, 1260. I'm getting 914. So that is the allocation. That is the allocation. That is the allocation. So that's step four. Now step five says recognize revenue as and when a transaction, as and when a performance obligation is satisfied. So this is where you have to be careful and be mindful of something very well. Under IFRS 5, revenue can be recognized at and revenue can be recognized over. When we say revenue can be recognized at, it means the date of the contract. Did we do anything at the date of the contract? If we did anything at the date of the contract, if a performance obligation is satisfied at the date of the contract, then we will transfer revenue at the date of the contract or we will recognize revenue at the date of the contract. But sometimes the work is over a period of time. So then there, are, there is a portion of revenue that will be recognized over the contract period. Are you get, getting it well? So revenue can be recognized at, revenue can be recognized over. So at the date that we signed a contract, did we satisfy any performance obligation? If the answer is yes, why not go for it? If the answer is no, then we were going to be recognizing the revenue at some time in the future. Why did I bring that up? We go back to Aaron's question. How do we recognize revenue? So at the date that he entered into the contracts, what do you think Tele PLC Limited will do? They will give him a handset. So what is going to be happening is that at the date of signing the contract, At the date of contract signing, 
Tele PLC will provide Aaron with the handset. As such, a revenue of 286, which is the handset's allocated revenue, is recognized. Sounds good? But remember principle number three in our takeaway. I said, where a performance obligation is satisfied, but the amount is yet to be received, the entity shall recognize revenue with a contract receivable. So what's going on here? You realize that even though we've signed a contract, we have received this. So at the date of the contract, this is the journal entry. Journal entry. We've not received any money from Aaron at the days of the contract because he will start making payment probably at the end of the month. So we've not received any money from him. So we're going to debit contract receivable with 286 and credit revenue because we've satisfied the performance obligation. Sounds good? That is at the date of the contract. So the handset, the revenue in respect of the handset will be recognized at the date of the contract. But the internet service portion of the revenue will be recognized over the 12 months period. Okay? To be recognized over the 12 months period. Are you following me well? To be recognized over the 12 month period. That is the life of the contract. So the question we then ask ourselves is, how do we do this? Remember, this contract assets in the receivables will not come in one block. Aaron will be paying every month. So what is going to happen is that we're going to look at the monthly allocation of the handset and monthly allocation of the internet services. So monthly allocation of handset, that's going to be the handset amount of 286, divided by 12, and then the internet service amount also 9, 12, over 12. So let's punch that out. Now, why are we doing this? I'm going to explain that to you in a moment. 286 divided by 12. I'm getting 24. 914 divided by 12, I'm getting 76. Stay with me carefully. So remember I said the internet service will be recognized over 12 months. That is why we are doing this. So every month, the internet service will recognize 17. So when we receive monthly payments or monthly, receive, monthly uh, payments from Aaron, of $100 from Aaron. What will be the double entry? This is it. You debit cash with the $100. Credit revenue with the 76. Okay, the over, the over, the internet service, which is over 12 months, then 914. Then the balancing figure is credited to the contract assets. Do you understand contract assets? That's the balancing figure. And that's the 24. So this is what happens every month. And we'll be doing this for the 12 months. And at the end of the 12 months, the contract assets or contract receivable that we recognized here will become zero by the end of the 12 months. And that is how 
we deal with revenue recognition. Any questions? That's the idea. So we said under IFRS 15, we need to identify the contract. Is there a contract with the customer? Yes. What is the entity doing under the contract? Free handset internet services. Number three, what is the transaction price? The amount receivable by tele PLC, $100 by 12. So how do we then allocate? The standalone prices are free handset is $300 or the handset is $300. The internet service would have been $960. We add it up, it's $1260. Okay, so we allocate. When we allocated, the handset is 286, the internet service is 914. Okay, we are saying that the handset will be recognized at the date of the transaction because immediately we signed a contract with Aaron, we're going to give him a handset. So at the date of the transaction, we recognize revenue. We recognize revenue. Then the internet service portion will be recognized over the period of the 12 months. So how much is chargeable or allocated every month to these performance obligations? And we have done it. So every month when the $100 become due, we'll debit our cash because we receive that. And then we'll credit revenue with 76. And the contract asset, which we debited earlier with 286, will now be credited with 24. And we'll do this over the next 12 months. And at the end of the 12 months, the contract asset or the contract receivable accounts becomes zero. That is the idea about revenue recognition when it comes to dealing with IFRS 15, the default treatment. The default treatment. But let me just give you some. A note here for you to take away. If there is a statement in the question and it says that, oh, it goes this way. So let me put it this way. Where the entity sells goods with a repurchase option. and the amount is included in revenue. This is not a sale. This is not a sale. The company has sold the goods, but has a repurchase option to it. So it is not a sale. And I'm going to explain this to you later on under IFRS 15. It is called a financial arrangement. And the goods have been used as collateral facilities. The goods have been used as a collateral facility. So uh, under that deal, under that kind of illustration, you don't treat it as revenue. So you have to remove the amounts from revenue by debiting revenue. Whatever amounts that was put there, revenue has a credit balance. So you subtract. When we say debit revenue, we mean subtracted from revenue. So you're going to subtract from revenue. And then you're going to recognize a financial liability. Okay, which is the fair value of the amounts received. Fair value of the amounts received. Then, because it is not a sale, the cost of sales of the goods must not be recognized, and the goods must be part of closing inventory. So what is going to be happening is that you're going to debit inventory, to be specific, closing inventory. Then you credit cost of sales. So you subtract that the cost of the goods from the this and that is with the cost of the goods. With the cost of the goods. Like I said, I'll explain this to you later on when we are solving questions, uh, but, but I want you to understand the idea in that regard. I want you to understand the idea in that regard. So when there is an entity and they buy, sorry, they sell a good, they sell some goods, but with a repurchase option, it is not a sale. It's a financial arrangement. Okay. It is not a sale. It's a financial arrangement and the goods have been used as a collateral facility. So in that case, we have to remove the revenue from revenue and rather recognize a financial liability. Then the cost of the inventory that is supposedly given to the buyer 
will have to be included in the closing inventory. So you have to debit closing inventory. That's why we debit inventory. And you have to remove the cost from the cost of sales. That's why you credit uh, the cost of sales because you've not sold it. So it cannot be part of cost of sales. Cost of sales is an expense. It keeps a debit balance. So when we say credit cost of sales, we mean deduct it from cost of sales. When we say debit inventory, inventory is an asset. It means add it to inventory. I hope you are getting the idea. And once you do this, we calculate finance cost uh, on the financial liability and recognize it in the PL accounts. So you calculate finance cost on the financial liability. And recognizing the PL in the profit or loss. The interest rate will be given to you in the exam hall, so you don't have to think about it. And that finance cost, you debit PL. So you're going to debit profit or loss because it's an expense with the finance cost. And then you credit the financial liability. You credit the financial liability. So what is going to be happening is that when we go to the statement of financial position, we're going to have financial liability being the fair value of the goods plus the finance cost that we calculated. And that's the current amount at the end of the year. Are you getting it? That's the idea. This is typically under IFRS 9, like I said, financial instrument. But because uh, it's it has that tone of revenue and you would think, oh, we can recognize actually a financial liability. So this is covered in under IFRS 9. But I want